Friends, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and in all truth with all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. Good morning. Today we begin a journey to the diocesan observance of the Feast of Absalom Jones. Absalom Jones was the first priest in the Episcopal Church, and I will talk a little bit about him today, and we'll have a little bit of an opportunity to hear some of his own words or read some of his own words and uh, reflect upon it. In addition, we'll look at a couple of other figures within the history of the Episcopal Church and ordination of African Americans within the Episcopal Church. So as we prepare for that service, we have the privilege of hosting the diocese, the entire diocese for that service on February 18th. And so we wanted to prepare the way for it, and we have a couple of ways we're going to do that. This week, we're going to talk a little bit about African American experience and ordination within the Episcopal Church. Next week, we have a special guest, Dr. Don Conley, who is going to talk about the Union of Black Episcopalians within the Diocese of Arizona, a little bit of the history of that organization. The following week, February 12th, we're going to take a look at African American spirituality as uh, is expressed through music and also the contemplative tradition. So what does it mean to be both uh, contemplative out of an African-American experience? And then we'll have the service on the 18th and then the week, uh, uh, excuse me, the uh, Sunday after that, that next day, February 19th, we'll have an opportunity to talk about what this journey has been for us. But we are so pleased to have the opportunity to have uh, or to be joined by the diocese in this celebration. Now, uh, some of you may know I was a historian by undergraduate training. Really? Yes. <laughs> Which unfortunately means I have a lot that I may get to today and a lot I may not. So we'll see how today goes. And I do want to make sure that we have an opportunity for you to be able to talk with each other and to, uh, to take a look at what the readings may mean for you personally. There are a couple of preliminary remarks, though, that I do have before we begin. So if I could have that slide, please. Every story of great success and triumph is also a story of struggle and of hurdles. The Episcopal Church's story around African-American inclusion and ordination is no different. So we're going to hear a little bit about those struggles as well. Those set the context for why we remember these people the way that we do. It also mirrors our country's story. We are the inheritors of the church, the Episcopal Church, being part of the Church of England, which founded this country before the church was disestablished, ostensibly by the, con uh, by the Constitution, but in the 1830s by the states. And in this, there are going to be four tensions that we're going to talk about. The first is a tension between Catholicity and racial religious identity. To be Catholic, small c, means to be universal. It means to live into that sense that God is no respecter of persons and that the gospel is open to all. On the other side of this, the Church of England, as it brought uh, people in to be enslaved, and also as it spread 
both in terms of the colonies of England and also in terms of the religion of the Church of England. It had an identity rooted in its English heritage, which included the idea that if you're Anglo-Saxon, you're better than everyone else. If you have Irish descent, you know that phrase, you know that sense. It's also the case that we're going to, um, that Anglo-Saxon identity was the pinnacle of what in the United States it meant to be white for a long time. For instance, Italians were not considered white until the 1920s, 1930s. They were excluded from that. So that's one tension we're going to talk about, is that issue of Catholicity, that unity within the church, but also the way in which a church can transmit or hold together this sense of a racial and religious identity at the same time. And how do people get included into that when their racial identity cannot change? We'll talk about the political versus the spiritual. What does it mean when your spiritual life is supposed to be divorced from your political life? When the two are not supposed to mix? And they do anyway, whether you want it to or not. We're going to talk about the fact that assertion and advocacy is not the same as aggression. Frederick Douglass once wrote that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. What happens when your assertion gets read as aggression? We're going to talk about how reconciliation and assertion are not antithetical to one another. Zora Neale Hurston wrote, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So can can we hear the assertion without it being seen as a threat? And if you've ever had to have a conversation of reconciliation with someone in which you had to start the conversation they were not willing to have, you know this dynamic too. So a few things I also need to say about uh, this, and this is about social location. Uh, It is a fashionable thing, uh, and it makes sense to me in academic settings that any time you talk about race, you start with social location. Typically, your own is the speaker. So here's mine. I'm a white man from Alabama. I left the Southern Baptist Convention when I was 17 years old. After, in a private conversation with my pastor, he told me interracial dating was against the Bible. The year was 2000. So, coming to the Episcopal Church felt like coming into a church that had at least left those vestiges of a racist past. I've spent the last couple of months buried in our own particular expression of that. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and at the same time, we have a great story within the Episcopal Church, and it's complicated, and it can be painful, and it can be uncomfortable, and there are things worth celebrating. Part of this was also a decision Then once I came into the Episcopal Church, I may as well be somewhere fighting for something good rather than nowhere yelling at everyone. (laughs) We choose where we live. We choose the communities that we are part of. And often the church chooses us too. So, just, that's just a little of what I'm carrying within me as I come to this. So we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start at the founding. I'm not going to give the whole story of race and uh, American history, but there are a couple of things I want to point out. So if I could, thank you. 
starting at the beginning of the American experiment, or at least the English colonies, in 1691, Jamestown is founded. Settlers come over, a couple of people who are also either indentured servants or slaves, and the House of Burgesses is formed. That's the first democratically elected legislative body in British American colonies. So that's awesome. It's the first one. Every legislator has to be a member of the Church of England. It's required. This House of Burgesses uh, forms a number or a basis of a lot of the legal system within our country. So, for instance, in 1640, the first uh, man is sentenced to perpetual slavery for attempting to escape servitude. Now, if uh, you have any experience w with law, if I, uh, if I may be so bold as to venture this, you don't, start, you don't make a law for something that hasn't happened. Usually something happens and then you have to make a law about it. So, this fellow attempted to uh, leave servitude, typically that's by heading west, and he was found and then sentenced to perpetual slavery. Years later, 1667, the House of Burgesses votes that baptism does not affect one state of slavery or servitude. This was a question. If we baptize them, should we free slaves? If we baptize them, does their indentured servitude end? According to the House of Burgesses, no. We're spiritually brothers and sisters, but that does not necessarily affect our uh, life on this planet or our social arrangements. You'll notice that I'm uh, getting these off of a timeline that you'll find in front of you. In 1691, the House of Burgesses passes Act... What number is that? 16, thank you. If any English woman being free shall have a child by any Negro, she pays the sum of 15 pounds sterling within one month after the child be born, watch this, to the church wardens of the parish where she's in. The church wardens. Sue, would you like to be paid for such? All right. The child shall be bound out as a servant by the said church wardens until he or she shall attain the age of 30 years. And in case such English woman that shall have such child be a servant, she shall be sold by the said church wardens. She shall be sold by the church wardens. Which is to say that the church was active in the economic policies of the day not more or less evil, the same. Now, the United States colony, or the U.S., hmm, the American colonies, we're not the U.S. yet at this point, had a problem of getting clergy to even come to the United States. It's far. It's across the Atlantic. They're barbarous. And that's the English that are there. So, slavery was one way in which parishes could attain the wealth necessary to be able to afford clergy and also be able to uh, pay for their coming over and their compensation when they were here. In 1705, the House of Burgesses passes an act concerning servants and slaves. That forms the basis of Virginia's slave system into the founding of the Republic. All right. Now we get to Absalom Jones himself. In 1746, two decades, 46, three decades before the revolution, 
He's born into slavery in Delaware. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So he is born. He spends uh, quite a bit of time in Delaware. He's a, f uh, he's a field slave during that time. And eventually, he gets separated from his family. In 1762, he's sold to someone who uh, lives in Philadelphia. And at this point, he works more in a house. He's more in an urban area as a result of this. He is the only one sold. His, uh, his sister... Now his mother and his, I think, uh, four siblings are sold elsewhere. I'm not sure if they were ever reunited. He, mar he gets married to uh, his wife, Mary, in 1766. And then it's uh, another 12, 12 years before he can purchase her freedom. They purchased her freedom first for a few reasons. The first is if they were to have any children those children, in theory, would be free. So this was their way of guaranteeing that if they had children, at least their children would be free. Also, they could put the property into her name so that they could actually purchase a house and the house would belong to them. He had the money uh, not that long after... Oh, I should mention this. When I say that... Um, Mary's freedom was purchased in 1778. That means he paid off the loan in 1778. He, had, he, he took up a collection, but it wasn't enough, so he also took out a loan to make sure it could happen with a number of different friends among the Quakers in Philadelphia. But it wasn't until 1778 that the loan or the debt was discharged. Jones had the money, but his, uh, his enslaver refused uh, to free him until 1784. He was 38 years old. You're younger than me. Um, when that happened, he could no longer go to his uh, enslaver's church, which was an Episcopal church. So he had to go somewhere else. He uh, went to uh, St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in 17, uh, well, basically that year. And he met up with a guy named Richard Allen. Richard Allen was another um, freed uh, slave. And they start ministry uh, among, the, um, among the black population in Philadelphia, slave and free. And in fact, they served people regardless of race. When smallpox hit Philadelphia, they served everyone. They were licensed as a lay reader, but they were also doing preaching and Bible study during this time. And as they, uh, as they were going, the black population of this Methodist church started to expand. It grew by leaps and bounds. Had a gift for ministry. These two did. Now, this was worrying to the people of that church who looked around and said, there's a whole bunch of black people here. And so the vestry met to, and voted to move black attendees of the church to the, upper, to the upper gallery. The Sunday that they tried to enforce this, Richard Allen, Absalom Jones, and a number of their congregants went down to that first floor and knelt. It's the first sit-in, the first kneel-in, the first pray-in. The ushers forcibly removed them. So they left that church and they, uh, they co-founded in 1792 what's known as the First African Church. It was uh, still in Philadelphia and they were kind of wondering, where should we go next? Because the Methodists just kicked us out. Richard Allen was kind of like, we need to form our own denomination, but it took him a while to get there. That's the foundation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME. Absalom Jones was of the opinion that uh, actually we should affiliate with the Episcopal Church. And so he started conversations with the Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church took in the uh, Free African Church, 
and they called it St. Thomas. Now, there was a catch. This is where assertion comes into it. They entered the Episcopal Church with the understanding that uh, nothing could be changed in terms of the way they ran themselves. In other words, it, it is a, uh, it's a free African church. It will remain a black church. The Episcopal Church was fine. It said, we want to get our people ordained. The Episcopal Church said, fine. We don't want this church taken from us. Okay, fine. But the provision of the Episcopal Diocese was that Absalom Jones could be ordained, however, they could not be seated at diocesan convention. The congregation could not, nor could the clergy there. Ostensibly, it was because uh, Absalom Jones didn't know Greek or Hebrew. But that fed into that sense of, um, at this point, this idea that um, blacks uh, do not have the same mental facilities. And so cannot be trusted with church governance, at least not at the diocesan level. But this is a tension of making a place where there is no place. They said yes to this with the idea that at least now we have a place of our own. And this is the first African-American congregation in the United States. So he's ordained a deacon in 1794. Most people who are on their way to priesthood spend maybe six months to two years as a deacon before they enter the priesthood. Very often it's one year. You waited nine years before he was ordained a priest. Now, during his time, oh, next slide, please. During his uh, time at St. Thomas, something particularly awesome happened within American history, and that was that the transatlantic slave trade came to an end, the legal transatlantic slave trade. This set a trajectory for the Civil War because this was one of the ways in which, uh, if you'll say, uh, the nation made it more untenable for slavery to continue as an institution because without the importation of slaves, slaves would become much more expensive. This did not end the illegal transatlantic slave trade but it ended the legal one. On page five in your handout, we have a sermon preached by Absalom Jones. Now, two other people that I <laughs> hope I get to in this presentation are uh, Polly Murray, first female African-American priest in the Episcopal Church, and Barbara C. Harris, first African-American female bishop in the whole of the Anglican Communion, and for that matter, uh, Christianity. They wrote a lot. They wrote so many things. We only have one sermon by Absalom Jones, and this is it. And the reason we have this is because the vestry of his church commended him for his sermon, and then requested he furnish a copy to be printed. Uh, this is a book of sermons from the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas. We have one of Absalom Jones, and we have like eight of his successor. But this is it. So um, this is not the full of the sermon. I highly recommend that you uh, find it and read it. Uh, it's available online. But I give an outline of it with a couple of uh, quotes from it. And I bring your attention to uh, the bottom of page five in italics. 
where Absalom Jones preaches. God has heard the prayers that have ascended from the hearts of his people. And he has, as in the case of his ancient and chosen people, the Jews come down to deliver our suffering countrymen from the hands of their oppressors. He came down into the United States when they declared in the Constitution, which they framed in 1788, that the trade of our African fellow men should cease in the year 1808. He came down into the British Parliament when they passed a law to put an end to the same iniquitous trade in 1807. He came down into the Congress of the United States the last winter when they passed a similar law, the operation of which commences on this happy day. Dear land of our ancestors, thou shalt no more be stained with the blood of thy children, shed by British and American hands. The ocean shall no more afford a refuge to their bodies from impending slavery, nor shall the shores of British West India Islands and of the United States any more witness the anguish of families parted forever by a public sale. For this signal interposition of the God of mercies in behalf of our brethren, it becomes us this day to offer up our united thanks. And the rest of the sermon is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and intercession. O thou God of all nations upon the earth, we thank thee that thou art no respecter of persons, and that thou hast made of one blood all nations of men. We thank thee that thou hast appeared in the fullness of time and on behalf of the nation from which most of this worshiping people now before thee are descended. Thou art no respecter of persons. He's quoting, Peter, uh, he's, he's quoting uh, Peter from Acts, Acts 10. That moment where Peter comes in to hang out with the Gentiles, who he's not supposed to be hanging with, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and all of a sudden, Peter and everything he knows about his faith is wrong. And God just proved it to him and gave him three witnesses of it. No, six men were with him. Twice what he needed to be able to go back to the other apostles in Jerusalem and say, I have seen something new. That God is no respecter of persons. I want to stop for a second. Are there any reactions to what has either been said or read so far? All right, I see two. And if you would please uh, give your name for the mic. Uh, Amber Lema, and thank you for asking for questions, because one thing that came up for me, um, it was almost uh, in passing that you said when you were describing formations of black churches and you mentioned uh, Barbara Harris, mm -hmm. I believe, and you said um, you think that was the first ordained black person in the history of Christianity, or not ordained, black but a bishop. Woman black woman, mm -hmm. and that would include the whole African continent, would it? And all of the... Okay, because it, that got me thinking when you said that. I was trying not to get too hooked on it and distracted, but it occurred to me that we're talking about black people in the Euro-American tradition, and then I, again, try not to get too distracted. I thought of all of the African churches, mm -hmm. and it made me very curious to know more about the Black African Communion in Africa. Mm -hmm. And because I know that there's a huge body and I know that there's a, an ongoing conversation and a lot of different conclusions and ongoing traditions between those two bodies. So yeah. I guess that's more of a musing than a question, but that's, so to clarify, that was the first black woman ordained in the world? Woman, as a bishop. Yes. The, key word in, yes. the key word for Barbara is woman. Woman, <laughs> okay. Um, 
and bishop. Women bishop. Yeah. Now, um, there have been African bishops since the beginning of Christianity. Uh, to this, um, often uh, Africans rightly point to uh, the um, Ethiopian eunuch, also in Acts. And uh, Augustine of Hippo, North African, who basically set the trajectory for all of Western Christianity. So it's not the first black bishop. Woman is the key. Um, we'll get there, I hope. All right. I'm Sally Benedict. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you specifically asked for reaction. I've been doing this almost since I entered the room. It just breaks my heart that, um, well, that people treat people the way they do. But I'm also, uh, you know, when I was looking around for a church, it was hard for me to come back to the church I was raised in, which was the Episcopal Church, because I, I knew their history mm -hmm. um, on this continent. But I'm, I'm grateful for this today. I'm, I'm grateful for what you present and how you present it, Robert. And, um, you know, I, I don't even know what else to say. It's just this touches me so deeply. And I just, I want so badly to be part of the repair. Mm -hmm. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Next slide, please. So from the, foundation, uh, from the founding of the Republic, from the founding of the US to the Civil War, what was going on? There were numerous African-American churches planted, both through the Episcopal Church, through the Methodist Church, through the Baptists. A number of these uh, congregations uh, sprang up. And there was a, a question of uh, the need to evangelize, but why and how? Salvation and civilization were seen in the same, uh, often the same. It was thought that what Christianity could do for uh, African Americans was instill docility in the enslaved. However, there was always noticed that Christianity has a threat for slaveholders. There's always a threat. Because Christianity has a liberative bent to it. And it has to be twisted in order to enslave. And Southerners could not always trust their northern counterparts in the church to hold that up. So there's tension between the north and the south in this range. This is true of a number of different denominations. A lot of denominations right at the Civil War split over this question. The Episcopal Church did not. Sort of. It was a schism that wasn't a schism. Now, here's what I mean by that. Oh, wait. Don't get political. It's a reminder for me. Southern bishops were quick to threaten to leave. Northern bishops uh, did as much as they could to uh, placate Southern bishops. And the tension of this was when someone tells you don't get political, that means don't change. To not change or to maintain a status quo is also a political decision. So northern bishops are on record supporting slavery as advocacy for the status quo. On page seven of your handout, I'm, I'm not going to read this part out loud, but you have a, a portion of a pamphlet by the right reverend John Henry Hobart. He was the Bishop of Vermont. He also became uh, a presiding bishop, and he was presiding bishop around the time of the Civil War. 
Now, I will not uh, read this to you, and I encourage you to perhaps look at this a little bit later, but the bottom line of it is he says, Jesus did not talk about slavery. Jesus left it in place, so we should too. The last line. How prosperous and united would our glorious republic be at this hour, around 1861, right before the Civil War, if the eloquent and pertinacious declaimers against slavery had been willing to follow their Savior's example. In other words, be quiet. Now, the northern bishops are trying as hard as they can to keep the Episcopal Church together, but with the Civil War, that's not necessarily possible. In a similar situation that what, uh, that what happened in the Revolution, um, the Episcopal Church does not split here over slavery. Instead, what happens is the southern states leave the Episcopal Church and form the Protestant Episcopal Church of the Confederate States of America. But the reason was similar to our uh, issues in the Episcopal Church at the Revolution. We're in open rebellion. How am I going to pray for the king? For the Confederate States, it's we're in open rebellion. How am I going to pray for the President of the United States? Now, they're fully aware that defense of slavery is, in their mind, in the South, a divine cause. And so they form this Protestant Episcopal Church of the Confederate States of America. And in general convention, during the Civil War, the Episcopal Church simply marks all of those dioceses absent. It just didn't come. After the Civil War, presiding bishop, John Henry Hobart, and Sam, Bishop uh, Samuel Seabury III. If you all know, Samuel Seabury was the first bishop of the Episcopal Church after the Revolution. This is his grandson. Make every effort to bring the southern states back. You will be warmly welcomed. You'll not be mistreated. Forget Reconstruction and what's going on with Congress. You will be welcomed back warmly. Initially, they refused to go. However, then convention happens, and a couple of delegates from the South go, and they are indeed warmly welcomed. And then later that year, they meet at, uh, the, the Southern bishops meet at their convention in Augusta, Georgia, and then decide, well, we're no longer in open rebellion. Our church has no reason to exist. We're going to go back to the Episcopal Church. That's what they did. As this is happening, as emancipation has occurred, a number of freed persons look around and recognize that the Episcopal Church was the church of their enslavers. We probably shouldn't be here anymore. And so they leave. It's a mass exodus. Often they were heading to a Methodist church or a Baptist church. Now, they have histories of racism that I can't get into right now, but um, what ends up happening, next slide please, over the course of the next hundred years or so, is what, are, uh, what is the status of African Americans within the Episcopal Church? So, for instance, in this country, it, was, it continued to be thought that uh, a black person was not morally or intellectually able to lead the church. And so the question came up, all right, well, we're an Episcopal church. Can a black person be a bishop? Would a majority white diocese accept a black bishop? And so a number of things were done to remove that threat of there being black bishops or what was seen as a threat. This included something called the Sewanee Canon Compromise. What this would mean is that there would, be, um, there would be missionary districts created that would guarantee that black 
bishops could not be elected. Basically, you keep the white bishop, but you have this missionary district in which all of the black people are supposed to be in. Hmm? Gerrymandering, yes. Separate but equal. And also not equal. So general convention itself was not integrated until 1955. What that meant was uh, up until then, the communion rail was segregated, as was uh, meals. Oh, by the way, that, that, um, that canon compromise, that creation of missionary districts, did not pass through the whole church. It did not make it a general convention. Because folks said, like, this would be an innovation of our ecclesiology. Usually, we have one bishop with one diocese, not one bishop with two different dioceses. So, it didn't pass general convention, but most southern states passed something like it anyway. It has uh, been noted that the uh, first... African-American bishops in the Episcopal Church were not deployed to the United States. They were deployed elsewhere, Haiti and Liberia. Then came the first uh, suffragan African-American bishop, uh, suffragan meaning that he could not vote in the House of Bishops. So we created a new form of bishop and then guaranteed it did not have power. So we struggled with this, much like the rest of the country. The Episcopal Church, however, was the first to pass any kind of national anti-lynching statement or resolution. That was 1919. And we integrated in 55, one, the year following Brown versus Board of Education. Into this church, Polly Murray was born. Braden, if you please. So if y'all have ever heard of Polly Murray before, uh, she's had three careers, stellar careers at that. And I originally started this on one slide, but it got way too small, and it's still too small, and that's just half of her life. Brilliant legal mind... And uh, there's a, on page seven at the bottom, I'd like to show you an example of, a, uh, of something she wrote in 1959. And this is where her advocacy for both women and African Americans within the United States and her, uh, her faith came together in this uh, poem. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. Teach us no longer to dread hounds yelping in the distance, the footfall at the door, the rifle butt on the window pane. And by thy great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. Give us fearlessness to face the bomb thrown in the darkness the gloved hand on the pistol, the savage intention. Give us courage to stand firm against our tormentors without rancor and teach us the most difficult of tasks, to pray for them, to follow, not burn, thy cross. To follow, not burn, thy cross. Second slide for her, please. Right? So she was ordained in the Episcopal Church at 67 years old. Sometimes it's not too late. Five years later, she meets mandatory retirement age.
If you look over on the right side of that same page, whatever future ministry I might have as a priest, it was given to me that day to be a symbol of healing. All the strands of my life had come together. Reconciliation drawing us all toward the goal of human wholeness. This was a woman who in 1940 was arrested for not going to the back of the bus. Advocacy can be in the service of reconciliation and it's not necessarily aggression. But as Zora Neale Hurston said, if you're silent in the face of oppression, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. So who gets to tell your story? Let's talk about Barbara, because we have 10 minutes. Same thing with her, I had to divide this up. All right. She, uh, she was deeply involved in the church for a long time. So born in 1930, she attended a St. Barnabas in Philadelphia. In the 1960s, uh, she shifted over to Church of the Advocate. She was also uh, a public relations officer for Sun Oil Company. And in her free time, she went and marched in Alabama and was present at Selma. She was a crucifer at the ordination of the Philadelphia Eleven. Now, those were 11 women irregularly ordained in the Episcopal Church in 1974 by retired bishops who had nothing to lose to make the point that women should not be excluded from ordination. Now, on page eight, at the bottom, Somewhere between 77 and 79, Polly Murray and Barbara Harris crossed paths. And when they crossed paths, Polly said to Harris, why aren't you ordained yet? And Harris said, I'm too old. Polly Murray was ordained in her mid-60s. Barbara Harris at this point is in her mid-40s. So that's the context for, that was a dressing down that day that I will never forget. Both of these women are examples of just have written too much that it's hard to pick what to point out. But I decided to go with a sermon on the occasion of Women's Day at uh, the historic St. Thomas Church, Absalom Jones's church, where she preaches on John 4, the woman at the well. And one of the points she's making, and I'll, I'll draw your attention to that last paragraph of this. If you're going to make use of a well, you must bring something with which to draw water. The woman told Jesus, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Now that paragraph. That is true of God's grace. Too many of us come to the well empty-handed. We bring no vessel in which to draw up the living water. People say, I come to church, but I don't get anything out of it. If you don't bring anything in which or with which to get something, then you won't get anything. We bring to the throne of grace the thin shells of ourselves instead of open, trusting hearts and souls, vessels with which to draw up the living water. If you don't believe God can do something for you, you'll never know when or what God does. Lastly, the Samaritan woman not only received a blessing, she went and told others, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Come see for yourself. 
the woman at the well became a well woman and shared her wholeness with others. Barbara Harris never intended to be a bishop. After her first interview, and the, some of y'all may know her, actually. It just occurred to me, like, um, we're well within living history now. I met her once, but some of you may know, have known her better. She never wanted to be bishop. She was going to be the first African-American bishop who was also a woman in the whole of the Anglican communion. This was a larger break than her simply being African-American or black. This became the cause of a number of people leaving the Episcopal Church. Women's ordination was part of it. And folks said, okay, maybe women can be priests, but that, that's, that's fine. It stops there. They're not in the apostolic succession. It's fine. But this became a real threat, a true theological innovation in the sense that this had never been done before. So she was made suffragan bishop. She put up with death threats leading up to her ordination. There's a great picture of her with Jean Robinson who also received death threats. They had that to bond over right before his consecration. Barbara Harris, um, that one time I did meet her, reminded me of my Aunt Mabel. By that I mean uh, she was occasionally crude and she smoked two packs a day. And I loved her for it. Because I, I don't smoke, but uh, I remember that from my childhood. But the reason she really reminded me of my Aunt Mabel was because I remember going through my, my spiritual journey. Uh, I, had a, I had a simple faith, and it was shattered. And then I had a complex faith. And I couldn't make sense of her simplicity of faith. And then I realized you pass to that eventually. The complex becomes simple. God loves you, and you can trust that. So for all the complexity of theology, it comes back to God is real. God loves you. Can you rest in that? That's how she was. She told me that day, there's nothing as powerful in front of you as who's behind you. And that's what I needed to hear in a third year of seminary. This was very cursory in the history of the Episcopal Church. We have much to be proud of. We have much to recognize. And we have much to think about what it means in terms of our call, as Absalom said and as Peter said, to be no respecter of persons. And to let that shoot through the whole of the church. Last slide, please. Not only did uh, Absalom Jones preached a sermon on the occasion of the end of the transatlantic slave trade. They commissioned a hymn for it. And these are lines from that hymn. If you would, please, would you stand with me? Let us pray. Then we our freedom shall retain in peace and love and cheerful toil. Plenty shall flow from the wide main and golden harvest from the soil. 
ye nations that to us restore the rights which God bestowed on all. For you, his blessing we implore. And listen further to his call. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us today and forever. Amen. Thank you.